Hello everybody, I'm Conquering History Games and welcome to another Kaiserreich Progress Report. Today we're going to be looking at pro Progress Report number 123, Russia Part 2. So in the playlist order, this should actually be directly after Progress Report 119, which was Russia Part 1, written by the same author, Rylock, um, former dev of Russia. And so uh, before we get into the audiobook session, he just says in the, his little introduction that... Um, they're actually not going to be looking at the other paths in uh, this progress report. They want to save that for the future. So instead, because there's a lot, uh, he says that there's um, 20,000 lines of code that is involved in Russia so far uh, with just this path. That's not the whole, uh, that's not all the other potential Russia paths. Just this national populist path in Russia is the largest in the mod. Um, of any, you know, country's event files. So instead, we're going to be looking at the five crises that could potentially happen in Russia prior to the Weltkrieg, as well as uh, the uprising in the Caucasus and Transmer, which we looked at a little bit, uh, in, well, more than a little bit, but uh, we're going to look at them in more detail than, than we did in the previous one. So we're going to go ahead and get started right now. Crisis number one, Finland. Very early in the game, a clash between Russian and Finnish forces near the Karelia border sparks a diplomatic showdown. Finland isn't yet a German ally, but it is friendly to Germany, so Finland has the option of appealing to their German friends for assistance when Russia demands Karelia be turned over in response to the incident. If Germany is willing to sacrifice some of its economic influence in Russia, they can shut this down early, but if they don't, it could quickly escalate into war. If Finland holds out long enough, they can engineer a stalemate, and that's victory, right? Don't worry, if the border clash never happens, Russia st does still get a decision to demand Karelia and start the crisis once they take an early war focus. Crisis number two, Mongolia. Mongolia, led by Roman von Ungard Sternberg, I know a lot of y'all will be happy to hear that, is one of Russia's few starting allies at the beginning of the game. Mongolia fought on Russia's side against Feng Tian in Japan in the 1927 war over control of the CER, and while that was a war Russia lost, Sternberg's Mongolia is still considered vital to Russia's far eastern security. Thus, both parties are put in a difficult position when a minor Mongolian noble up and attacks a Russian train in late 1936. It exposes Sternberg's increasing lack of control over the Mongolian natives, one that demanding extradition of the criminal will only exacerbate. Yet the train massacre becomes such a sensation among the Russian public that the government almost can't refuse doing something. Does Russia demand action and anger its military? Refuse and anger its people? Or will Sternberg gamble that his Russian allies won't push the matter to a war in hopes of placating the Mongolian nobility? In case you're wondering... Oh, I gotta adjust the mic. In case you're wondering, yes, Mongolia has had its early game content expanded with events and a new focus tree for Sternberg's Mongolia up until the chaos in the capital event chain begins, it could potentially lead to Sternberg's downfall. The Return of Vasily Boldriev Around the beginning of 1937, the situation in the Caucasus will have worsened. The government's attempts at land reform have made things awkward in the region between the Russian Inogrodinian, the uh, Cossack landowners and the native mountaineer cultures. Always a hotbed for conflict, this one offers an opportunity to the Vasily Boldrev, the general who led the unsuccessful push against the Russian government in 1927. Since then, he's been in exile in Georgia with a handful of followers, and now he's offering a deal to the Georgian and German governments. Funnel money and equipment to him, and he'll start a resistance against the tyranny of Savinkov, one which will eventually grow into an army. Assuming Germany goes along with this plan, this begins a chain of events which results in Boldriev's forces finally being revealed in the Dagestan region. From there, the resistance modifier will spread to nearby states, especially any states that were formerly part of Georgia or Azerbaijan, but which Germany, excuse me, but which Russia has since annexed. Russia receives decisions to push back against the resistance, though once it's started, they can't eliminate it entirely. Any state which has the resistance can be activated by Germany as the Free Russian Army once war between Germany and Russia begins, a Reichspact ally which will play into any potential peace treaty with 
or annexation of Russia in the future. The territory occupied by the Free Russian Army depends entirely on how successful Bodryev's revolt has been. Uh, for example, oh shoot, I think I forgot to put the picture in here. Dang it. Well, you guys can look at the report, but uh, yeah. So, so, so basically, like you can take basically all of the Caucasus, but you could actually go further north potentially. So, is this what's become of the Don Kuban Union? You might ask. Yes, it is. Can you play it? Yes, you can, though its content is limited to what it does during the war with Russia. Boldriev's goal, after all, is to topple the Savinkov government and return Russia to democracy, so victory entails a tag switch back to Russia, though it does come with a unique path thereafter. Crisis number three, Georgia. Reading about Boldriev's use of Georgia as a base to funnel equipment to the Caucasus rebels, you might ask, does Russia never realize what's happening? The answer is yes, they very likely will. Georgia might not be keen on the entire idea, but at the very least, it's unlikely to stop Germany from using its supply lines, not without starting an entirely different incident of its own. See the upcoming Georgia content. If this is happening, Russia eventually gets wind of it all and must decide whether to do something about it. Again, Germany has the potential of intervening on behalf of their potential ally by bribing Russia with economic influence if they still have any. But otherwise, it could come down to Russia invading. If they take Georgia, the spread of Boldriev's resistance will be severely hampered. Crisis number four, Central Asia. You might look at the lack of the Alash autonomy in Central Asia and feel a pang of regret. Never fear, the government's land reform programs also caused renewed problems in Alash territory. Here, the reform has started a new wave of Russian settler migration, and that's kicked off both conflict with the region's Cossacks and left the native Cossacks holding the short end of the stick. Their plight reaches a point where many will start fleeing to neighboring countries or seeking aid among such powers as Japan, India, or the Ottoman Empire. Here, the crisis has a lot of routes, depending on the actions the government takes and whether any foreign powers decide to meddle. The crisis may not happen at all, and the trouble will eventually die down. Either that, or the Kazakhs could rise up, rise up initially in Severichev, uh, but potentially taking along much of their core territory. And when they go to war, they might even bring the Central Asian states, such as Kiva, Bukharin, and Turkestan, along with them. Semyonov and the Circle of St. George 1938 brings a different kind of unrest for the Russian government to handle. Previous to this, Russia and Japan are likely to have a number of diplomatic clashes from an incident... Oh, what? Okay, hold on a second. Okay, sorry about that. Apparently a lot of the links are uh, broken, but I found some alternate pictures that we could use. All right. Where was I? Uh, 1938 brings a different kind of unrest for the Russian government to handle. Previous to this, Russia and Japan are likely to have a number of diplomatic clashes from an incident on the Amur River between Angun and Blogdovshchensk to an accidental seeking of a Japanese vessel off the coast of Sakhalin. This eventually leads Japan to consider whether it should resurrect its policy of trying to establish a buffer state between itself and Russia, and from this, a possible consideration of using exiled General Grigory Semyonov towards that end. Semyonov has allies among the Honghuzi and Chinese mercenaries, and if funded by Japan, he will also reach out to dissatisfied elements of the Russian army in Vladivostok. The resulting unrest, once it begins, is a product not of an unhappy local populace, but the Russian forces being confused and undone from within. Much like Boldrev, Semyonov and his forces will slowly spread across Transmur and potentially the Transbaikal region. They do so much more slowly, however, and if Russia spends resources to oppose them enough via decisions, the same as with Boldrev, it's actually possible to retake control of Vladivostok and prevent any further trouble in the east. Failing that, Semyonov and his Russian army allies will make their move once Russia is distracted by war with Germany. Transmer is aided by Japan, but is not a Japanese ally and part of their faction. Not yet, anyhow. Semyonov's goal is not to topple the Russian government, but to take over Siberia as his own personal domain, a goal that could be achieved if Russia is ever defeated in the West. The actual territory initially taken by Transmer depends on how far the resistance has spread. Note that it won't always be called Transmer. The name is dependent on how far the resistance spreads. That just hasn't been implemented yet. Is this, you might ask, the new version of Transmer? It is. Can you play it? You can, once it appears. In fact, there's content for what happens when Semyonov takes over Siberia. Now he must contend with either satisfying his Japanese allies and entering their faction, or satisfying the Circle of St. George, who led by Mikhail Dietrichus, 
uh, insist on claiming the remainder of Russia in order to restore the monarchy, and who are very much opposed to the notion of being Japanese lapdogs forever. Crisis number five, Ukraine. The last potential crisis is perhaps the most dangerous, as it involves a country which is already a member of the Reichsbach. The coal mining companies in the Ukrainian Donbass region are largely Russian and notoriously averse to the idea of being dictated to by the German government. An incident that could occur in late 1938 can spark their paranoia into becoming active strikes, and for the Russian coal miners to call on the motherland to intervene on their behalf. Naturally, if Russia chooses to do so, it's now a diplomatic crisis between itself and Ukraine. Unlike with Finland and Georgia, Germany can't shut down the crisis with economic influence. They can offer it, but Russia can refuse. Should Ukraine not surrender the Donbass, it could go to war. Though at that point, Russia is fighting alone against the Reichspak very early. Something which might not at all go in its favor. So the alternative is a separate mechanic we call the coal crisis. A contained border war inside the Donbass with small Russian and Ukrainian units acting as the combatants. This doesn't use the vanilla border war mechanics, but rather has both sides selecting tactics on a bi-weekly basis in order to increase their advantage in the Donbass. Choices made previous to the beginning of the crisis can affect whether either side begins with any advantage. If one side gets enough, they will win. If the coal crisis drags on for too long without resolution, Ukraine wins a stalemate victory by default. Russian victory, however, means both obtaining the rich Donbass without an early war and managing a powerful diplomatic defeat of both Germany and its most powerful East European ally. Uh, that's it for this uh, PR. Uh, the next one very likely will look at other paths for Russia, but don't expect it to be right away. The only other thing I'll leave you with is a look at something else we're working on, namely a revamp of the peace mechanics between Russia and both Germany and Japan. The latter meaning peace with Russia doesn't always require conquering one's way across all of Siberia, and the former offering a way to end the war which doesn't require the complete annexation of Russia, something that's been requested for some time. Until next time, here's the Russian rework team signing off. Enjoy. So there's a there's a picture that I was actually uh, missing here. Give me a moment. It's uh, this one. This is the coal crisis. Uh, so yeah, you're gonna have two weeks to decide what to do here. Attack, defense, counter. It's gonna kind of be like a uh, like a more complicated version of rock paper scissors. Um, slightly more complicated. Uh, anyway. Um, the Russia rework's looking great. I'm super duper looking forward to it. As I've said before, I was a big fan of uh, how Russia has been and how it's evolved. And um, I'm also really looking forward to this video being demonetized because of the Russia-Ukraine usage and Donbass and oh boy, y'all are gonna have a field day in the comments. Um, but you know what you could do to support a channel that's gonna have a demonetized video up? Is by becoming a member, go ahead and click that join button down below and uh, support the channel. Membership exclusive streams every Sunday. I'm Conquering History Games, and you have yourselves a wonderful rest of your day.